Welcome to lecture six. In the last lecture, we've introduced the basic framework of static games as the beginning of game theory,、uh, which is、um, the start of our analysis into the foundation of multi-agent systems. We've、um, also introduced a very important solution concept, namely Nash equilibrium as a strategy profile where every agent. Is playing the optimal response to the opponent's strategies. So a natural equilibrium will be seen as a state of the game where no player has the intention to deviate from their current actions. And、uh, as a result, it's、uh, representing some sort of stabilizing configuration.、Um, we also showed. Uh, in the last lecture, that the notion of natural equilibrium is very robust in the sense that any strictly dominating strategy equilibrium is also Nash equilibrium,、uh, and also if there is a equilibrium that's the unique one, which satisfies IEE, so that's iterative el elimination equilibrium, then it's also Nash equilibrium, right? So so far. Uh, we've defined Nash equilibrium from the point of view that、uh, an agent will choose an action in a deterministic way, and、uh, once the action is performed, that's the only action that it's performing.、Um, but the problem with such an assumption is that in real life situations,、uh, we Uh, such a deterministic、uh, actions may not be accurately describing what's happening in real life. So imagine we have this very simple game, and we have two people who are playing、uh, with coins. So everybody has their so both player has a coin. They take out their coin, they put it on the table, and they can choose to、uh, put. The coin will、uh, put the coin with either the head up or the tail up, and、uh, if the 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 faces、um, are matching between the coins, then both coin now belongs to the second player. If the faces do not match, then both coin belong to the first player. So the first player prefers a situation where the two coins. Uh, having different faces up, so it's head and tail, and the、um, second player will prefer the situation where both coins have either both heads or both tail up. Right. So this is called matching pennies,、uh, and we can easily draw a payoff matrix for this game.、Uh, remember, in this matrix, we have、uh, two by two.、Uh, Matrix where the vertically、uh, the column indicates the option of player two, and the rows indicates the、uh, option of player one.、Uh, you can see that、uh, whenever there is a match, so we have head and head, then player two will win one dollar because he would take the dollar from player one, and player one will lose the dollar. Right. Similarly,、uh, if you have head and tail, so if the, there's a mismatch between these two coins, then player one will win one dollar and player two will lose one dollar.、Uh, this is in literature we call this a zero sum game because in every outcome of the game, a win for one of the player is a loss for the other player. Right,、uh, and. If we analyze Nash equilibrium in this case, you can easily see that、uh, there is no pure strategy Nash equilibrium as we defined last time,、um, because of exactly the the the, the disparity, right?、Uh, and、uh, as a result, we if just use the previous、um, notion, we cannot. Predict what's going to happen. Yet this is such a simple scenario, and we can say something about what will actually happen in real life.、Uh, consider a situation where you are playing as player one, and you are facing an opponent. Then your strategy in real life is really just to make the actions uncertain. So what do I mean by that? Is you you do not want player two to 
uh, have an idea of whether you want to play head or tail. Because if player two knows you're going to play head, then player two will respond by head, and vice versa. So、um, instead of choosing concrete strategy, there is a desire for each player to keep the opponent guessing. Yet in the previous notion of Solution concepts that we introduced, say Nash equilibrium, we cannot capture such uncertainty, right?、Uh, and this brings up to the notion of mixed strategies. A mixed strategy is really a mathematical model for us to represent、uh, these sort of uncertainty in the players' decisions. Right, so we have a game with n players, and each player has their、um, actions. A mixed strategy for a player, instead of fixing a concrete action from the set of actions, it's a probabilistic distribution that's defined over the action space of the player. Right. So instead of saying I'm definitely going to choose this action, I'm saying I'm going to choose this action with、uh, 0.5 probably, and then I'm going to choose the other action with 0.5 probably. Or it could be that I'm choosing this action with 0.2 probably, and the other with 0.8. Or if there are more than two actions, then I can just distribute the probabilities、uh, among all of the actions. Right. So in this way, a mixed strategy is a generalization of a pure strategy, where a pure strategy can consider it also as a mixed strategy, where one of the action has a probability one and the other action has probability zero. Yeah, and then we can of course this define the mixed strategy profile where all the players are playing somehow some sort of mixed strategy, and that profile just a tuple of mixed strategies of all the players. Right. As an example, in the matching pennies game, where we have two options for each player, then、um, for example, one of the mixed strategy could be say player one is playing head with zero point three and tail with zero point seven, so thirty seventy、uh, divide between the options,、uh, and then player two is playing head with sixty percent chance and forty percent chance for tail. Right,、uh, that could be an example of a mixed strategy profile. So、uh, with that, everything that I've,、uh, that we've discussed、uh, earlier about Nash equilibrium can be generalized to mixed strategies.、Okay. The next question is:、uh, It seems a little bit odd because in the framework that I described, they're saying the players are choosing a one-off, simultaneous, and independent. Actions and everybody does this at the first step of the game, and then the outcome is reviewed. Right. So it feels like、uh, it's impossible for the agents to play a 0.5 of a certain action and 0.5 of another action. Right? There's no option for a player to, in one go, to play both strategies. However, you can think of it just like what I described: a, a mixed strategy is somehow representing a probability distribution.、Uh, and、uh, if a, if we repeat the game many many times, then the percentage of the player playing This strategy is、uh, consistent with that distribution. Right. This is one of the interpretation of a mixed strategy. Another interpretation will be population proportion. So imagine it's not just two people who are playing the game, but it's basically the game is between two large populations. Uh, where uh, one of the population plays a role of player one, and the other population is playing the role of、um, player two, and then the strategies of individuals may differ. So、uh, you can say that the mixed strategy now becomes sort of a representation of the pop the proportion of the population who are adopting a certain action.、Um, another, the third、um, interpretation of the mixed strategy is、um, more from a subjective、uh, view. Of probability, where probability either can be seen as frequency or it can be seen as a strength in the belief of certain events、um, of of happening. Right, so the 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 happening of a certain events.、Um, if a strategy gets a certain、uh, probability, then it means that the opponents will believe that this player will adopt the strategy with、uh, that strength p. 
right? For example, in the matching pianist game, uh, when we say that uh, player two is playing 0 0.6 and 0 0.4, it means that we believe that player two will, uh, with with a 60% confidence, we, we, we predict that player two is going to put forward head and 40% um, the player two will be put forward tail. Right? So <clears throat> uh, in the in the real world modeling and application, uh, these are the ways in which we could interpret mis mixed strategies, right? Uh, but mathematically, it's just modeled as a probability distribution. And um, we now, because it's a probability distribution, we cannot just say that the, the payoff will be a certain payoff because um, player any player can mix somehow the, the strategy. So um, with 0 0.5 probability, I'm going to play this action and 0 0.5, I'm going to play the other action. So what is the final payoff for this mix strategy? Then we are actually looking at the expected payoff according to that distribution. Right. So the player's goal is to maximize the expected payout, which can be calculated by this function, which I define here. That will be uh, summing over all of the strategy profiles, the, the pure strategy profile for all of the agents, and you multiply the probability of every player adopting that corresponding strategy. So basically, this is the product of all of the probabilities of player J playing strategy SJ in the strategy profile S, uh, and then multiply with the I uh, player's payoff, which is FIS. Right? So we sum up all of these probabilities, and then we've got this number, which is the expected uh, payoff. And like what I said, the player's goal is to maximize these payoffs in expectation. <laughs> so uh, we look at this, uh, again, this matching penis game where the two players have two options. Assume player one adopts a mixed strategy and because there are only two uh, actions, we can use a single real number R to represent this uh, mixed strategy because R is the probability of playing head and therefore probability of playing tail is one minus R. And similarly for player two, we can use Q to denote player two's probability of playing H and Y minus two, one minus Q for playing tail, right? And then in this sense, player one's expected payoff will be uh, given the strategy profile RQ, the mu one, which is player one's expected payoff will be R times negative Q plus one minus Q because if you look at uh, the first row, this is uh, corresponding to player one's uh, strategy of playing H with probability R. And in this sense, uh, player two has Q probability of playing head. So this would give negative Q reward to uh, player one, and uh, there is also a one minus Q chance of uh, player two to play tail, and this will give a reward of one minus Q to player one. Uh, so in this row, we've got negative Q plus one minus Q, and then this times R, because that R is the probability of player one plays head. Uh, similarly, for the second row, we have one minus R probability for player uh, one to choose that row. And then inside the bracket, we have Q minus one minus Q. Uh, and altogether we have two R plus two Q minus four Q R minus one as the expected payoff of player one. And because this is a zero sum game, so the corresponding expected payoff of player two will be just a negation of player one's expected payoff. And so that doesn't really give us uh, too much information from analyzing the expected payoff. But what we can do is we can uh, try to imagine that certain the, the, the player will uh, choose a certain fixed value uh, as their mixed strategy. For example, if we assume that player two would choose Q equals to 0 0.5, we can now analyze uh, the situations where player one chooses head or player one chooses tail. So suppose we know that player one would choose head. Then uh, if you analyze player one's payoff, 
it will in fact be uh, if we just look at the uh, first row of the table player one's payoff will only depend on the value of q because we know that player one will choose head right uh, and in that case player one's payoff will be negative q plus one minus q which gives us one minus two q right and because q is 0 0.5 uh, this value is zero now suppose player one chooses t then we look at the second row and uh, in the second row player two player one's expected payoff will be uh, q minus one minus q and that will be two q minus one uh, because q is 0 0.1 uh, 0 0.5 so also we get zero here so it means that um, for player one both of the actions of H and T will give exactly the same ex expected payoff, assuming player two would choose Q equals to 0 0.5, right? So at this instant, player one is actually indifferent because playing either one of the action will not lead to a better payoff uh, than the other action. Right? So in this sense, uh, either of these two actions can be adopted by player one. But now let's think of the situation where player one will also choose r equals to 0 0.5. This is when um, r, you know, you, you know the, the, the probability of adopting uh, the first row and the second row have the same um, has the same probability, uh, then let's consider from the point of view of player two, if player two chooses to play head, then the expected payoff will also be zero because it's two R minus one, and player two's uh, payoff for choosing T is also zero. So at this moment, it, it, it means that player two is also indifferent between these two strategies, H and T. Right. So now we've got these uh, interlocking situation. Uh, at this moment, the player, the opponent of any player, would not have a desire to deviate from this mixed strategy because if he plays um, higher of one of the strategy and lower in another strategy, it doesn't really bring up the expected payoff for this player. So playing at 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 will be stabilizing, right? So that uh, essentially corresponds to uh, what we call the mixed strategy in Nash equilibrium. So you can see that this is just a natural generalization from the pure strategy in Nash equilibrium. Uh, a mixed strategy is a best response to the opponent's strategy for, for player I uh, is when uh, if the player adopt any other mixed strategy, it will not get a higher payoff for the player um, given uh, that the opponent's strategy are fixed. Right, so this is the best response, and a mixed strategy in actual equilibrium is a state where everybody is playing their best response mixed strategy to the other people's um, mixed strategies. So essentially, it's just a natural equilibrium, but uh, where the strategy are replaced from, uh, where the pure strategies are replaced by mixed strategies. Notice that, like what I said, any pure strategy N E is also a mixed strategy N E, uh, and we. Typically, I mean, this course, we when we when I say Nash equilibrium, implicitly I mean it's mixed strategy Nash equilibrium from now on, unless sometimes I explicitly say it's pure strategy Nash equilibrium. <clears throat> um, so, uh, in as illustrated in the last example, we see that when both R and Q is equal to zero point five, that's in fact a Nash equilibrium for the matching penis game, right? You can see from the analysis that I made above, one of the crucial um, aspect in determining whether a strategy is a natural equilibrium is to look at a state of indifference. Right, so what do I mean by that? Uh, we define the situation when the player is indifferent uh, on certain strategies, if any pure strategy leads to the same expected payoff. Right. Um, so suppose we have a game with two players and each player has exactly two strategies. 
What is a mixed strategy? Well, a mixed strategy. What is a mixed strategy? N E. A mixed strategy. N E. Is exactly when、uh, one of the players play a certain strategy, which makes the opponent indifferent between the two pure strategies. In this sense, the opponent would not have a、um, desire to deviate from the current action. Right. So. We have actually two situations that、uh, can lead to Nash equilibrium. First of all, either P one is a pure strategy that is the best response to the other player, right? And in this case, if there is one action that is a pure strategy, then the most sensible for this agent to do is to adopt this pure strategy, and then we just get a pure strategy outcome. But、um, it also could be the case when、uh, PI is a mixed strategy and player I is indifferent, and in this sense,、uh, either of these two actions are okay. So any sort of mixture、uh, will be seen as、um, stationary because the player does not want to deviate from that mixture. Right, so that's、um, uh, the crucial aspect for the game. But here we are analyzing only two player game, where each player has exactly two strategies. Right, let's look at this simple scenario where we have two American football teams, and、uh, in a game of football, <clears throat> a team can adapt one of two strategies:、uh, either run or pass. Right, so there are two. There are two um, um, players, and suppose that in a single play, one of the team is attacker, and one of the team is defender. Then the attacker can choose to attack using either the strategy of run or the strategy of pass, and the defender can choose to defend using either the strategy of run or the strategy of pass. Right,、uh, and、uh, when they play this game, of course, they make simultaneous decisions because they have to make a decision before、uh, knowing what the strategy of the opponent does. Right. So、uh, now, if you think about it, if、uh, if an attacker、uh, correctly matches defender's play, then the attacker. Gains zero yard because the attacker、uh, strategy has been matched, right?、Uh, so he cannot progress. If attacker runs while the defender defends against the pass, then this is good for the attacker because the defender chooses a、uh, wrong defensive action against the attacker, and therefore the attacker can win by five yards. Um, but on the other hand, if the attacker passes while defender defend against the run, then this will give actually attacker even more advantage because the pass supposedly is a is a quicker way to gain yardage in this、uh, football game. So in that case, the defender made a mistake of defending against the run while the attacker chooses to pass, and the attacker will gain ten yards instead of five yards. Right. So in that situation, we can draw this、um, payoff matrix. You can see that essentially it's very similar to a matching tennis game. The only difference is that the payoff、uh, for unmatched cases are different. Right. So it would be zero zero and zero zero on the diagonal, and then on the off diagonal entries we have five negative five and ten negative ten. Right. Now we want to find the Nash equilibrium of this game. There is no pure strategy Nash equilibrium as in the matching tennis game, but we could、um, analyze the、uh, mixed strategy. So now let's suppose that defender adopts a mixed strategy of Q and one minus Q. Right. And now let's consider if if we are focusing ourselves on mixed strategies, then the state of indifference is really what we're looking after. Uh, this is when the defender, for example, the, the defender plays Q and one minus Q at a certain level of Q, which makes the attacker indifferent between pass and run. So indifferent means that the attacker is completely uncertain about the decision of the defender, uh, and uh, as a result, uh, 
there's need there's a need to mix pass and run. So so suppose the attacker adopts a strategy one zero. This is you know in the case of a pass, the expected payoff for the attacker would be just ten times one minus q. Right. This is when the defender defend against run, whereas the attacker chooses to pass, and the gained the expected gained yardage will be ten times one minus q, so ten minus ten q. But if the attacker chooses to run, the only way the attacker uh, the attacker gains an, a positive payoff is when the defender chooses to defend against pass. And the probability of that is q, right? So the expected payoff is five q. <clears throat> so when would the defender? Uh, so so what's the level of q that would make the attacker indifferent? That would be when we have ten minus ten q is equal to five q, where q is equal to two thirds, right? So this means that in order for the defender to make the attacker indifferent. Between his strategies, between their strategies, is to play pass at two thirds of the time to to defend against pass at two thirds of the time and defend against run at one third of the time. Right. So that's that's the defense strategy.、Uh, but now let's look at the attacker strategy. Suppose the attacker adopts a mixed strategy of R and Y minus R. Uh, and uh, now we analyze the defender. So if the defender adopts to defend, defend adopts a strategy to defend against pass, then the expected payoff will be negative five times one minus r, so five r minus five. And if the defender chooses to defend against run, then the expected payoff will be negative ten r. Right, so if I set negative ten r is equal to five r minus five, then again r is equal to one third. <clears throat> so in order to make the defender indifferent between pass and run, the attacker should choose to pass at one third of the time and、um, run at two thirds of the time. Right now we've got this very interesting situation. The Nash equilibrium. Remember, in in this Nash equilibrium is when. The players are playing at a situation to make the opponent indifferent between his two strategies,、uh, and at that moment, the player would, the opponent would not have any intention to、um, change the current strategy. So the only natural equilibrium, according to the analysis that I just made, is when the attacker chooses to、uh, run. At two thirds of the time, while the defender chooses to per, de, to defend against pass at two thirds of the time, so you can see that there's a disparity. There's a there's a disparity, even though the attacker spends less effort in passing, the defender will spend higher effort in defending against passing. Right, and there could be a lot of real-world interpretation to this phenomenon. So, although passing is attacker's more powerful weapon, it would use it less than half of the time, right? Because the、uh, defender is putting on more effort to defend against、um, passing, right? So, if attacker places any higher probability on passing, defender's response will be to always defend against pass, and attacker will actually do worse than the current state.、Uh, on the other hand, the defender will defend against pass two thirds of the time, while attacker uses pass only one third of the time. What does it mean? Well, correspondingly, this means that the defenders are actually doing this out of the threat that's. Poses by the attacker to adopt passing, right? Because passing will hurt the defender more、uh, if passing was undefended. So even though the attacker does not spend、uh, so much effort on passing, the defender will still need to choose to defend with、uh, two thirds. Of its、um, probability, so, so that's that's an interesting interpretation in terms of this real world situation.、Um, in in fact, this analysis is matched well with empirical observations. So people in sports science have、uh, 
uh, lambing gathering data about uh, footballs and the strategies of the teams. And in general, people can observe that the teams generally run more than they pass. And but if you if you analyze the expected yardage gained per play from running, in fact, it's very close to the expected yardage gained per play from passing. This this shows that at this uh, instance, people are indeed adopting Nash equilibrium. Right. So this is only the situation when we have two-player game with um, two options for each player. But what if we have a more complex situation? So suppose we stay at the uh, situation where we have two players, but each player has more than two uh, options. Let's say three options. So consider this game where we have a three-by-three three payoff matrix. And uh, if we consider the strategy, so we, uh, I gave you three strategies, Q1, Q2, and Q3, uh, and that's 0, 0, 1. So the first one is a pure strategy. The second one is 0, 1, third, 2, third, and third one is um, just a uniform distribution among the strategies. Here we have Q1, Q, Q1, Q2, Q2, Q3, Q3. Why do I always pair the strategy with the same strategy? Well, if you analyze this, um, payoff matrix, if you just look at the matrix formed by the first coordinate and the matrix formed by the second coordinates uh, of these values in all of the entries, you see that one of the matrix is the transpose of another matrix. So this matrix, this sort of game is what we call a symmetric game. Right. So this means that if we switch the rows between player one and player two, then we get exactly the same game. Right. And uh, in this, uh, in, a, in a symmetric game in, in, in this way, uh, always uh, we will be looking at a situation where player one and player two adopt the same strategy against each other, right? Because they, they have symmetric um, roles in this game. So um, to, to analyze a game like this, um, we would want to uh, borrow or need to bring a, a slightly more complex definition in order to generalize uh, the analysis in two option case. Uh, and uh, this notion would be the notion of a support. So suppose we have a mixed strategy P1, PI1, PI2 up to PIM. So this is a mixed strategy of player I. The support of player I of this strategy will contain all of those uh, indices of the pure pure strategies such that pij is greater than zero right for example uh, the, the first strategy is zero zero one like what i said it's a, it's a pure strategy the support of that pure strategy is three so that three is says that essentially player one uh, adopts the strategy which only plays uh, which only plays action three Right, so three is the only element in the support of the strategy. On the other hand, if you have zero, one third, and two thirds, so that mixed strategy, the support of it is two three, because um, player one will play this game using a mixture of the second action and the third action. Right, the first action is out because it has zero probability. But the second and the third have non-zero probability, and therefore both of them are in the support of this mixed strategy. And similarly, the uniform strategy cases when we have one third, one third, one third, all of the pure strategy are likely to be played, and therefore the support contains all of the uh, strategies one, two, and three. Right, so that's the notion of a support, and. Uh, <clears throat> The, the, the key to finding the Nash equilibrium lies in making sure that, first of all, any pure strategy in the support is a best response. So what do I mean by this is that um, if you want to have any strategy that are within the mixture of your strategies, it means that uh, it should not be dominated by another strategy. So this means that... Um, Given the opponent's strategy, um, playing this strategy will not give you a worse payoff than playing other strategies. Because if it does, then 
why do we put it into the mixture? Because it's it's worse, right? So if there is another strategy that has a higher payoff to us, we would just switch to the other strategy instead of playing this strategy. So if it is in, uh, if it's it's if it's a part of the best response mix strategy, then that pure strategy has to give us the best response. Secondly, uh, among all of the strategies in the support, remember uh, they are all best response uh, best response strategies, right? Uh, so among all of these strategies and support, they should be really giving us the same expected payoff. And this means that we are indifferent among those strategies that are in the support. Right? So of course you can see that A would imply B because if any strategy in the support is the best response, then the payoff that it gives would be the same for all of the other strategies in the support. So A implies B and we're only concerned about A. So we only care about the situation uh, when uh, we want to define a mixture of strategies. So basically we want to define a, some sort of mixture with certain support where uh, a strategy, uh, if it's included in the support, so if I have a non-zero probability in my mixture, then it must give us a best response. And if it's uh, not, then it should have a zero chance of being played in my mixed strategy. So the support theorem is saying like this, a mixed strategy PI is the best response to the opponent's mixed strategies if and only if for every strategy, pure strategy in the support of that mixed strategy, the pure strategy SJ is the best response. All right. So that just captures what I said above. Um, how do you prove it? Um, I essentially have um, intuitively described the proof with you. Uh, in my slide, there is a short. There, there are two short paragraphs that uh, justify the theorem. Um, of course, also in a, in a rather loose language. So notice that the payoff of the players in the example above remain the same if the two players swap their role. Right, this will be um, what I talk about as the symmetric game, right? So in any Nash equilibrium, in such a symmetric game, we will have that the uh, mixed strategies adopted by the players being the same. So P1 will be equal to P2, right? Um, formally, it's captured by the definition on the slide where I define the symmetric game as one where we have A equals to B transpose. Right, so where A, B are respectively the payoff matrix of player one and player two. And uh, a Nash equilibrium is symmetric if P1 is equal to P2, right? So now we only focus on two player symmetric games. Uh, and this means that our goal is to find a symmetric Nash equilibrium uh, for this game. <clears throat> Of course, uh, this is not a severe restriction of the cases we want to study. In fact, for any non-symmetric game, in order to find a Nash equilibrium, we can simply reduce it to a symmetric game. Uh, and then we apply the algorithm that I'm going to describe to you now uh, to find the corresponding symmetric Nash equilibrium, which gives you uh, the Nash equilibrium of the original game. But I won't tell you the reduction, so it's left for you as a homework. I'm going to introduce this uh, algorithm for finding mixed strategy Nash equilibrium in the symmetric two-player game. Um, and uh, because it's a symmetric, we only need to consider <clears throat> the matrix of one of the players. Say we have M by M matrix for player one, right? And the player two's payoffs will be just a transpose of uh, this matrix A, right? So now uh, we want to output, we want to identify a mixed strategy Q of the player so that if both players play this strategy, they are in this Nash equilibrium. Um, according to the support theorem, um, we, well, first of all, uh, let's make some observations. 
um, first, well, because the mixed strategy that we are aiming to find is it's, it's a mixed strategy, so every entry QI represents a probability, and therefore it would be greater or equal to zero, right? And also we can express the expected payoff for choosing for any player to choose strategy I given that the opponent is playing the strategy Q and that could be defined as a linear sum of um, the uh, payoffs for each of the uh, options. So this will be AI1 times Q1 plus AI2 times Q2 and all the way to AIM times QM and we add them all up, right? So that's the expected payoff of one of the players, assuming that the opponent is playing at Q. Right. Then uh, with this in mind, then we can um, somehow put a bound on the expected payoff. Uh, and uh, instead of looking for directly the value of those Qs, uh, just to make our life simpler, we can imagine these cues are uh, instead some sort of weights. And uh, <clears throat> what we wanted was that for any i from 1 to m, these weights, and which I express as z1, z2 up to zm, each of the zi would be greater or equal to zero. And also, uh, I want to normalize the expected payoff. So it, it doesn't have to be any fixed value, but I just need to normalize it to be that the highest value to be one. Right? So I want to make sure that the expected um, uh, sum of a i j times z j for all of the j from one to m, uh, that's no more than one. Right. Um, so once I can find such z, so that this collection of weights from z1 to zm, uh, I will be able to normalize the vector to derive that uh, my probability qj will just be equal to the corresponding proportion of zj in the overall sum of the zj. So this is just a simple trick, algebraic trick, um, that make my life simpler. Right, so I do not need to look at just probabilities, but just arbitrary weights. And then later on to get the probability, I just need to normalize the value of Z. Right, and there the, the, the final output will be, of course, the tuples of uh, Q1, Q2 up to QM. That's the mixed strategy that I want to find. Um, and also there are a couple of assumptions that I need to make. Um, I can uh, restrict myself to the case where um, all the numbers in the payoff matrix A are non-negative. Right? Um, if it's not, ne if it's not everywhere non-negative, I can somehow put some extra payoff um, <clears throat> to each of the entries in the matrix um, so that they become non-negative. And also, I assume that A contains no non, no all zero columns. Um, so I just need to add sufficient amount of payoff to each of the uh, entries to achieve that. So this is not a severe restriction. Uh, we consider the following inequalities, right? These two inequalities, but for every i be between 1 and m, we have two inequalities. One is that the linear sum of all of the aijs and zjs is less or equal to 1, which I just described above, and then also each of the z i is greater or equal to zero, right? Um, now we have uh, two m inequalities, right? For every action, we have two inequalities. And and we also have exactly m uh, variables. So we have a m dimensional space where each of the z m, each of the z j is a real value. So we're looking at a m dimensional Euclidean space uh, and all of these inequalities, if you put them together, will actually define a polytope in that m-dimensional space. Right? And uh, they also define the feasible region as those regions that are under uh, each of the inequalities, so, so each of the lines. Right? That's uh, That forms a polytope. And... Uh, we, we make a second assumption, which is that the polytope is non-degenerate. This means that every pivot lies on exactly M uh, lines, M um, 
hyperplanes uh, of the space. <clears throat> So once we have these uh, assumptions, then uh, we can now start to find Nash equilibrium, uh, mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Let's consider this example where we have the previous game. Uh, and remember, we only need to have the payoff matrix of one of the players. So I have this matrix A. We can then write down the inequalities. And remember, there are um, six inequalities because of the three-dimensional space. Uh, so we have Z1, Z2, Z3 being the variables. All of these variables are greater or equal to zero. And we also, uh, by looking at each of the rows in the matrix, we can see that uh, we have a inequality that three times Z2 is less or equal to one. So this com comes from the first row. So essentially we have zero times Z1 plus three times Z2 plus zero times Z3, which is less or equal to one. So this is three Z2 is less or equal to one. Similarly, we have 3 times Z3 is less or equal to 1, and we also have 2 times Z1 plus 2 times Z2 plus 2 times Z3 is less or equal to 1. So we have all of these six inequalities, and uh, in this diagram, I've illustrated the polytope that I generated for the feasible region defined by these inequalities. And uh, we make some simple notations for any uh, tapu Z. <coughs> Uh, and uh, uh, for any i that are between 1 and m, we say that the z eliminates i if zi is equal to 0. So intuitively, this corresponds to the case where I do not put the i uh, action into my mixture. Right? So i will be not in the support of my final outcome p which is the mixed strategy i'm looking for uh, and we said that z maximizes i if the linear sum of a i times the vector of z is equal to one remember uh in order to uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at all of the possible solution of z which satisfy the inequality, then this means that ai times z would be less or equal to 1. And the fact that ai times z equals to 1, it means that the combination of value of z will make this linear term the highest value, the highest possible value, because ai times z would not be more than 1. Right? Um, so this basically means that uh, when z maximizes i, then I will be a best response for the opponent. All right, so now I have these uh, two possible cases. Either uh, zi is equal to zero. This means that we do not include action i into my mixture, right? We do not include it into the support. Or uh, the overall expected payoff is maximized, right? And uh, we say that Z handles I if either one of these two is true, right? In fact, what we're looking for will be a vector Z which handles every uh, pure strategy I, right? So either for any pure strategy I, either it eliminates it or it maximizes it. Right. Um, notice that uh, one of these z that satisfy this condition is trivial because the origin eliminates every uh, strategy uh, and therefore it's of course handles every strategy but this is obviously not what we're looking for because the origin corresponds to a case where we do not act right um, what we want to find is in fact any z which is different from the origin so that at least some of the um, action will be put into the support. Nevertheless, it will satisfy uh, all of the conditions of either it eliminates uh, uh, I or it maximizes I. Right? Um, notice that because the fact that we're looking for such Z and each of these um, uh, equalities above the, the definition of elimination and maximization, uh, basically uh, they correspond to extreme values in the inequalities. And therefore we are essentially looking for pivots 
of the polytype, polytope. We do not looking at interior points, right? Uh, and at that moment, we know that this state would be a Nash equilibrium, right? So consider this game. Um, how do we find a pivot which satisfy our requirements? We can uh, make certain traversal within the polytope because we, we can start at the origin. At the origin, it is the case when uh, all of the strategies 1, 2, and 3 are handled because all of them are eliminated. So they are handled. But we want to start from there and start to traverse the along the uh, edges of this polytope to explore iteratively pivots on this polytope until we find uh, one of the pivot which satisfy our requirement. Right. So um, if we look at this example, we have this polytope. The only non-zero pivot that handles all of the pure strategy is the um, pivot 0, 1, 6, 1 third. And this is corresponding to the point um, in the right-hand side corner of this polytope. So beside each pivot of the polytope, I uh, write down numbers. Um, you can see that just beside the origin, I have number 1, 2, 3. This means that one, all of 1, 2, 3 are satisfied. Uh, uh, handled, uh, and then there are some pivot with a one squared, so there's a superscript two and three. This means that this uh, pure strategy one is both eliminated and maximized, uh, while three is uh, also handled, but two is not handled. Right, so I have one square three. Also have uh, one two square. This is corresponding to the situation when one is handled, two is both eliminated and maximized, so it's handled essentially twice, uh, and three is not handled. But then there is another pivot with one, two, three, that is the pivot where all three uh, pure strategies are handled, and that corresponds to the pivot zero, one, six, and one third. Right. So essentially we're looking for this particular pivot uh, of course, we can. Uh, there are only finally many such pivots. We can just examine each one and see which one satisfy our requirement. But uh, still, we haven't answered this very crucial question: is why such a pivot exists at all? Right? We know that zero, the origin, is the pivot that handles all the requirement or all, all the pure uh, strategies. But why is there another? pivot that also handles all the uh, pure strategies, right? This is not clear at all, but I'm going to give you this algorithm which essentially says that such a, uh, such a pivot must exist. So what we're going to do is for any z, we assign a number of labels, uh, and these labels will correspond to the uh, numbers 1, 2, 3 that I uh, illustrated in the in the last diagram. So for every i, if z eliminates i, then we add a label i. If z satisfies uh, a i z is equal to 1, so this means if z maximizes this i, we also add a label i. Right? So this any label can appear at most twice. And by assumption 2, every pivot lies on exactly m hyperplanes defined by inequality of the form either we have a i z equals to one or a z i equals to zero, so every pivot receives exactly m labels, right? So in the previous case where we have possible labels one, two, three, for every pivot it will have exactly three uh, labels. It's just that two of these labels may be the same, right? So like origin will get of course labels of all of the values from one to m. And every pivot has exactly n adjacent pivots, right? Because they are lying on exactly, uh, sorry, not n, uh, m 
uh, adjacent pivot. So that means every pivot lies on exactly m lines, uh, and therefore all of these adjacent pivot can be reached by traveling along one of the edges of the polytope. So what we do is starting from the origin, we can start to walk along one of the edges to an adjacent pivot. And I call this adjacent pivot V1. Right? I can do this by relaxing uh, any one of the axes. So it could be that I relax, say, the T's axis, say, ZT. I can, I can, because ZT in the origin is equal to zero, I can relax it to make it bigger than zero, uh, but keeping the other values at zero. Um, and until I walk to the next pivot, right? Uh, if ZI does not handle all the strategies, then uh, if you think about the label of Z1, right? This this is the first um, the first pivot that I find. Uh, the label of this pivot uh, will not have uh, a T label on it, right? Uh, and therefore, it must have two k label for some other k, right? Because every pivot should get exactly m labels. And if there is no t label, then there will be a repetition of some label in, in some other value k. So inductively, we want to construct a sequence of pivots. So essentially, this will be a traversal along the edges of the polytope to visit pivots one by one. And uh, each of, apart from zero, each of the pivots that we visit, it will not have any T label on it. Why? Because whenever there is a T label on it, we've done, we've done. We, we, we've got this pivot that satisfy all the, that, that, that handles all the um, values, right? all, all the actions. Um, so in each of the ZI, I will not have T label, then I will have two K label for some other K. It's just that these Ks may be different across the uh, different ZIs, right? And for every ZI, there are two direction of relaxation. Either way, I move backwards, which is not what I want to do, or I can move forward. I can extend the path to the other direction to extend the current path to a new pivot, right? And this new pivot will be ZI plus one. And if this new pivot ZI plus one will contain the label T, then I basically stop and I say that that pivot is the one that I'm looking for, right? Otherwise I keep going uh, for my search. So now the question is, why should the search stop? So why would eventually I'll be able to see any pivot that contains T? Well, uh, we ask three questions to answer this. Um, so first of all, um, it, would it be possible that once we go on and on to search for new pivots, we come back to one of the pivot that I have already uh, visited. This is my first question. So would I enter a circle uh, according to my strategy? No, right? Because every pivot has exactly two directions. If any of the zi plus one is equal to zj for j less than i, then zj has three distinct direction of relaxation, which is not possible, right? So that's obviously not possible, but what about um, would any ZI be ever become the origin? Because the origin, of course, um, satisfy, handles all the, um, the, the, the actions. Um, this also is not possible because the only neighbor of zero that does not handle T is Z1. Uh, all of the other neighbor, neighbor of the origin will handle T. So T will be part of the label of these uh, other neighbors. Uh, but according to my assumption, whenever I visit a new pivot, this pivot, if it's not the final pivot, it will not have a label T on it. And therefore I will never uh, visit back the origin. So the second question is no.
The last question is: Would the past be extended forever? Would it be possible that I go on forever? No, because there are only finitely many pivots. Right. So eventually, the past will stop. It will never go back to zero. It will never go back to a node which I already visited. Uh, so after finally many pivots, I eventually terminate, and when I terminate, that must be one of the pivot with a T label, and that's the one that I need as the Nash equilibrium. So that Z will uh, be the one which satisfies the requirement that either for every i, either Z i is equal to zero, or I have a i times Z is equal to one. And once I have that, and it's also not the Origin. So once I have that, I can use it to construct my Nash equilibrium. Right? So this finishes the algorithm, and also the proof that um, such a pivot, which satisfy all the condition, exists, and therefore the Nash equilibrium must exist. And remember, this is a mixed Nash equilibrium. Right? So if you look at this example, starting from one, two, three, um, I randomly choose one of the directions to go. I say I go to this. Uh, um, pivot with one, two, two uh, labels of one because I'm relaxing um, x two, so I'm relaxing the second dimension. Uh, so I have uh, one, one, three as the label, and this means that I have two directions of relaxation. Either I go back or I move forward to relax this extra one, uh, and if I do that, uh, I will. Uh, get one three three so so two lots of three labels so and and when I go up to that pivot this is not what I'm looking for and then I go down to this other pivot uh, one one three again I have one being handled twice and three being handled and two is not handled and then I make another step and then find this um, pivot that handles every one of the one, two, three. So that finishes the traversal and then finds the Nash equilibrium. That I so uh, here I'm giving you the uh, pseudocode for the lemke holson algorithm, which I just described. Um, I'm not going into the detail. You can read it. Essentially, it's um, following um, the order of traversal, tra you know, traveling along edges of the polytope that I described earlier. And uh, then I can make um, one of the perhaps the, the, the most well-known and also very fundamental result in the whole of game theory, which is the uh, Nash theorem. It says that, um, well, in fact, it says that every finite uh, player game where every player has a finite number of actions or pure strategies has at least one mixed strategy Nash equilibrium and this is in fact um, um, uh, attributed to Nash who proved it in his original paper in the 1950s but if you examine the proof of Nash you can see that the proof uh, is an existential proof so this means that the proof well, because it uses some fixed point theorem, it uh, asserts the existence of the Nash equilibrium without effectively finding uh, the Nash equilibrium. It, it takes people um, a few years afterwards to actually construct this effective procedure, this algorithm that finds the mixed uh, Nash equilibrium, which I just described to you as the lemke holstein algorithm. Um, so. Yeah, we, we were just looking at this effective version of the proof of Nash's theorem. But of course, only for two-player symmetry games, which is a very simple case. For the other cases, in fact, you can do some other reduction uh, and simplification. Uh, so essentially, the core of the proof will be um, for the case of two-player symmetry um, case. So this finishes my lecture on mixed strategies. We've examined the notion of mixed extra, uh, strategy, and uh, we um, basically analyzed the two-player, two-action game, and then using the idea of indifference to solve that game, right? And essentially the attack-defense game and so on. Um, and we defined the notion of support and the support theorem, which leads to very crucial idea 
of mixed strategy game for a mixed strategy uh, Nash equilibrium uh, for any <coughs> game. And then we introduce a Lemke Hosen algorithm to find a Nash equilibrium in such a game, right? So that's uh, today's lecture, and I'll see you in the next lecture.